junior in high school uh, when I first started attending church. I, I was invited by my, my best friend. I, I started attending with him and his family. Uh, I had never been to church before. In fact, everything that I knew about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or the Bible or anything, I had learned from television. And so uh, my understanding of God was that he could help you out when you were in a bind, you know, important situations like needing to win a basketball game or get out of a speeding ticket. However, if God were to help you out, it required you promising that you would never do anything wrong. Again, that was the extent of my theological understanding as a junior in high school. And then I started attending church church. And very quickly upon attending church, uh, I realized that, that TV probably hadn't equipped me as well as I thought. And so I started paying very close attention. I was extremely curious. I had a whole lot of questions that, w- that were just kind of residing in my head. I, I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I just paid attention. And then one day something completely out of the ordinary happened for me. Uh, I, was, I was in a service, and, you know, it was going as normally, and, and then they announced that there was going to be a baptism. Now, I had seen baptisms before at this church in the short time that I had been attending, but this one was different. This one was unlike any baptism uh, I had seen to that point, because when the lights came up in the baptistry, there stood Jeremiah Krigbaum. And Jeremiah Krigbong was a friend of mine. He, he was a year behind me in school. We hung out. We, we had similar interests, similar experiences. Like, this was someone I know. So for the first time in my 17 years, and now in my first time in attending church, I was watching someone who I knew, who was my age, be baptized. And, and so that caused all those questions to just like swirl immediately. Like, and, and it created new questions immediately. I want to know why is Jeremiah doing this? Like, how is Jeremiah doing this? Like, what initiated this? Like, did somebody ask Jeremiah to do this? Did, did Jeremiah ask if he could do this? Did he just walk down there and it, and it happened? Like, like, what is happening right here? If, if Jeremiah is doing it, is this something that I should be doing? Now, the, for the next couple of weeks, those questions, they, they just continued to swirl until the, the high school minister at that church, a guy named Scott Hatfield, a good friend of mine, uh, reached out and he, he asked me if I wanted to get some food. And, and so we went to this place called Ramsey's Diner. We sat at a corner table. We ate burgers, drank ale ate one. And, and he noted that, that he, he had noticed that I had been coming for a while. And he said, you seem like you're paying very close attention. So I was just curious do you have any questions about what you've observed? Do you, do you have any questions about this whole church? Do you have any questions about God? And it was like the floodgates got open. I mean, I just unloaded on Scott. I, I started asking all these questions. I started sharing all these observations, all the things I was curious about. I have no idea how long we sat there. It could have been an hour. It could have been three days for all I know. But what I do know is, is that Scott sat there and he patiently listened to all of my questions. He, he patiently listened to all of my curiosities. And then he gave thoughtful responses. And Scott spent however long we sat there articulating to me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we got, when we got finished, when we, when we got to the end, Scott said, okay, now hearing all of this, what do you want to do about it? I said, well, well Scott, I want to follow Jesus. I, absolutely. I, I want to go all in with Jesus. What, what do I do? He said, well, the next step is I, I think you should get baptized. And so I did. The very next Sunday, I got baptized. And I, I can now confidently tell you uh, another lifetime later that, that everything about my life changed because of that, that conversation. You know, that, that sounds somewhat, you know, melodramatic and ultra spiritual, but it's, it's true. It's, it's hard to quantify. It's hard to truly articulate. But I, I can confidently tell you that everything from that day forward was altered because of that conversation that led to that decision. It changed absolutely everything. It changed every decision I would make from that point on. It changed the trajectory of my life. It changed every relationship I would participate in from that point forward. It changed absolutely Absolutely everything. But I often wonder, as I reflect back on my story, as I I reflect back on that transformation, I I wonder what would have happened. That that day that Jeremiah Krigbaum got baptized, that day those questions just erupted into a tempest in my brain. What if right after Jeremiah had come out of the water, right after we clapped and, and celebrated Jeremiah, what if somebody had said, hey, does anybody in this room think that because of what Jeremiah did, they should do that? I think immediately I would have been like, well, yeah, probably. Like me, like, I mean, he's younger than me. Like a whole year. Like I, I, I have more life experience. I, like if he's doing it, I should for sure be doing it, right? Like I, I should do that. And I've always been really grateful that that, that didn't happen. 
And it's not that I, I wouldn't have loved to you know, be baptized into the name of Jesus a couple weeks earlier, but I'm really glad that conversation at Ramsey's Diner happened. Because I walked away from that, not just understanding what I was doing, but I understood why I needed to do it. You see, why? Why changes everything? I, I often think about a uh, church. You know, uh, imagine if somebody were to stumble into our church who, who had no concept of church. Like, unlike me, they hadn't learned anything from TV. Like, they no concept whatsoever of church. They've never heard of it. They've never seen it. They've never been to it. They don't understand anything this is about. Imagine how weird it would be to them. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like how weird the stuff we do at church is, but we just, we've just accepted it because it, it's what we do. Like imagine they come in and they sit down and, and in unison we all stand up and start singing. That doesn't happen anywhere else in life. Like unless you live in a musical, like that just doesn't happen. Like you're not at work and one person stands up and goes, okay, we're going to sing now. Like that doesn't happen. Like as you're walking through the store, hey, let's all sing. Like that just doesn't happen anywhere else, but it happens here and, it, and it's just normal to us. But imagine what they'd be thinking if they had no idea why we were doing that. Imagine what it would be like when we got to communion. I mean, I mean, think about it. Like, they have no idea why we do it. They have no idea what it is. They have no clue what's happening. And, and we, we chill out. Like, we get real calm. And, and, you know, the lights even come down a little bit. And we're like, okay, now we're going to take this meal together. And they're like, oh, sweet, a meal. And then we, we pass out, like, these, these little pieces of bread and these tiny little cups of juice. And we say it's bread. I have no idea what that actually is. But, like, we, we hand them that. And they're like, well, this, this is not a meal. What is this? And then we explain this, this, this bread, it represents Jesus' body. And this cup, it, it represents Jesus' blood. And we're going to consume it now. And they're like, what? Why are we eating Jesus? Like, what, what is happening right now? It would be super confusing. But imagine if somebody got baptized and, and they had no idea what was happening. And, like, they see somebody, like, climb up into the baptistry and the lights come up and, and they repeat a short phrase and then they get dunked under water and we all go crazy. They'd be like, why are we, why are we excited about this? What, what just happened? Like, has this person never been underwater before? Like, did they just overcome a fear? Why are we excited about this? It would be weird, and it would be confusing. Now, obviously, all of this is, is an exaggeration. Like, like, we don't truly believe uh, that, generally speaking, somebody's going to come in here that has absolutely no concept of what church is or what church does. Like, like I said, most of them have learned from TV the basics, so that they wouldn't be taken that off guard. They may not 100% understand everything we do, but they wouldn't be completely taken off guard and, and, and shocked the, the way I, I just exaggerated there. But, like me, pe people do have questions. And I often wonder, like, how good are we at articulating why we do the things we do? You know what I mean? Like, like how good are we at explaining to people, yeah, this is why we sing? How good are we at explaining, yeah, this is why we, we take communion? This, this is why people get baptized. I think if pressed, we could come up with some answers and, you know, any one of us could, could explain, you know, generally why we do those things. But, but I would wager that somewhere in our argument, somewhere in our defense of these things, somewhere in our explanation, the, the phrase is going to present itself, we do it because it's just something we do. I mean, we sing because we sing. Like, like it's just something we do. Like, we take communion because, you know, Jesus told us to. Like, yeah, it's just something we, we get baptized just because you get baptized. Like, it's just something Jesus told us to do, so we do it. Now, I, I bring all this up to, to emphasize that why matters. Why is ultra important. Why changes everything. From time to time, we have to stop and we have to ask why. That, that's really a, a big piece of this series. You, you are here. It's not just to determine where you are, but to determine why you need to take a step, why you need to move forward, why you need to dive deeper and deeper into Jesus. And, and as we continue that journey today, we want to talk specifically about baptism. It's a, it's a huge aspect of our faith, one of the, the most crucial elements of our faith. And it's crucially important that we understand why do we do it? And we're not just going for the easy answers. Like, like we're not just going, well, because Jesus did or because God said so. Like, those are easy. We, we want to dig deeper than that. We want to get to the hard stuff. What, why did Jesus tell us to do this? Why, why has God invited us to do this? Why do people do it on a regular basis? Why did I? Why did some of you? Why should you if you haven't? Why get baptized? So to have that conversation today, we're going to dive into one passage. It's a huge, famous passage. You've likely heard it before. It's in Matthew chapter 28, way at the end. Uh, we know it as the Great Commission. Uh, th this is a charge from Jesus to his disciples. It's a really big deal. Here's what Jesus says, verses 18 through 20. 
Uh, he says, and, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Like I said, really big deal. Big deal because of when this happened. See, Jesus spoke this to 11 of his disciples. There was 11 because Judas had betrayed him and he was no longer in the picture. And so these 11 remaining disciples, they gathered in a place that Jesus told them to wait. Jesus came to them and he spoke this charge. This happened after the cross. This happened after the resurrection. This happened after a sequence of about 40 days where Jesus was appearing to his disciples. And this happened right before, literally moments before Jesus ascended to heaven to sit on his throne for all of eternity. This is a transitional moment. Everything that God has been promising throughout the Old Testament, the kingdom that he is going to build, and the king who is going to sit on the throne of that kingdom, that has all come to fruition in Jesus. The kingdom is here. The king has been established. He will now reign for all of eternity. And this moment marks the exact moment that he takes all that authority that is his and he shares it with these disciples, literally charging them to pick up what he has started and carry it forward. This, this is huge. It's going to change everything about their lives. It's going to change everything about the future of church. It ultimately changes everything about our lives. It's a huge moment. And every single word that comes out of Jesus' mouth here is hugely important for us to understand. And, and so we'll move pretty slowly as we press through this. Now, th this, this charge that, that we find in the middle is, is, is bookended by two promises. The first promise is that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus declares that all authority in heaven, all authority on earth is his. This, this is hugely important for two reasons. Number one, by, by claiming all authority in heaven and on earth, Jesus is effectively claiming all authority there is. Because there's no other place for authority to be. Like he has all the authority that's in heaven. He has all the authority that's on the earth. There's no other pockets of authority out there. He has all of the authority. That means that Jesus is unequivocally claiming that he is in complete and total control. His father has given him all authority there is. Nobody else has any. He has it all. He is in control. The second reason this is hugely important is because Jesus is about to share that authority. So think about that. The, the, the sole bearer of authority is about to share some of that authority with these disciples. The, the, the sole possessor of authority would never do that haphazardly. So what Jesus is about to do, the, the transition that's about to take place, the extension of power that's about to happen, it is being done extremely intentionally, carefully, and knowingly, Jesus, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. It's a big moment. The second promise comes, comes later in verse 20 when Jesus says, And surely I will be with you always until the very end of the age. This is huge because what Jesus is saying here, not to quote Carrie Underwood, but he's, he's promising that he's not going to take his hand off the wheel. Okay, he, he's not dispensing his power. He's, he's not giving his authority to these disciples, shooing them away and saying, Good luck, figure it out. He's sharing his authority. I mean, he's inviting them into his authority to share it with him. He is promising that they will move forward. They will move forward in power. They will have unlimited access to power from an unlimited source of power in him. But he will walk with them. He will take this journey side by side. I will be with you always even to the end of the age. These are the promises that hold up the charge that Jesus will lay on the shoulders of these disciples. All authority is his, and he will be with us always as we carry that authority and do the thing that he has called us to do. And so then he gets into the thing he's calling us to do, and it all begins with one word, go. Go. Go, 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 go. 
It's huge, it, 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 it's super intimidating at, at first. Like when we first hear this word go, I mean, it, it's one word with two letters, but it, it's hugely intimidating because immediately when we hear Jesus say, hey, go, like our minds go, like really far away, right? Like immediately we start thinking of missionaries in like foreign countries, like un, uh, you know, inhabited places with like just scarce people dripping everywhere and like they have never heard of Jesus and we're living in tents and, and we're speaking in languages we're not familiar with and it's, it's super super uncomfortable and stretching and extreme. Or maybe our minds immediately go to, to you know, being in handcuffs with, with, with pillowcases over our head, about to be executed by persecutors. You know, like we immediately we go to the extremes and say, yeah, that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Go, go and do the scary, dangerous stuff for the gospel. But the reality is that, yes, Jesus is going to call some people to do that, Maybe even people listening today, Jesus is stirring in your heart a, a call to go to the extreme. But, but what Jesus is, is saying here isn't so much associated with that. It's not so much associated with the far away things as, as it's actually associated with the very, very close things. You see, better translation of the word go would be a phrase as you are going. It was a colloquial way of saying, as you are living your everyday, ordinary life, do this. You see, we often mistake go as the charge. Like, the charge is to go. Like, that's where Jesus is placing the emphasis. Go is not the charge. Go is the venue where the charge takes place. And that venue is quite literally wherever you are and whatever you are doing. And so it could be like as you're going to the ends of the earth and, and reaching untouched and un, unreached people. It, it could be as you're weathering persecution. It also could be as you're going to work or as you're walking to your neighbor's house, as you're going out to dinner, as you're going to practice, as you're volunteering at your kid's school. It can be as you're going absolutely anywhere. J Jesus isn't, isn't speaking of the extremes here. He's actually speaking of the very, very simple, the very, very near, the very, very ordinary. And every single second, every single minute, every single hour of your life, you, you, you're called to, as you are going, do this. And, and what's the do this? What's, what's the charge? What's the thing Jesus is commanding us, challenging us, charging us to do? It's very simple. Make disciples. He says, make disciples, therefore go. Make disciples of all nations, meaning every single person you encounter as you're going, no matter where they are, no matter how you encounter them, every single person you encounter, that is your opportunity to make them into a disciple. Invite them, encourage them, lead them into the heart of Jesus. Make disciples. It's exactly what Jamie was talking about last week when, when he talked about going all in on Jesus. That's a disciple. That, that's what we're encouraged to be. That's what we're challenged to go and make. People that are willing to go all in, leave everything else behind and go all in on Jesus. Now in the Old Testament, those, those types of people were always marked by two things, faith and obedience. A uh, different way of saying those two things would be belief and, and trust. They, they believed wholeheartedly that God was who he said he was and had done what he, what he claimed to do, and, and they trusted in his power and plan for their lives. People that exhibited those two things, that, that faith and obedience, those were people associated with the kingdom that God was building. But remember, the kingdom has just become tangible. It's a real kingdom now. It's, it's not just a kingdom that, that we're, we're talking about is coming and, and we're prophesying about it and we're pointing to the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now, and the kingdom has a king. And he's not figurative, he's literal, he, he's in the flesh, he's Jesus. And this, this tangible king leading a tangible kingdom in this very important moment is now offering his disciples, as you go, as you make disciples, some tangible ways to do that. Here are some tangible ways that you and everyone you lead to me can begin practicing faith in obedience. So this is huge. This, this is the climax of our whole discussion. It's, it's hugely important because here's what Jesus says that, that we will now do. We, we, in order to make disciples, we will baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit, and we will teach them to obey all the commands that he has given us. There's faith and obedience. Faith is, is being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Obedience is learning to live in all of the commands that Jesus has given us. But remember, our, our point today is why, why baptism? Why is it important? It's not just because it comes out of Jesus' mouth during the Great Commission. Why does this matter? Why does Jesus point to baptism and say, this is it. This is a tangible expression of faith. This is what I want you to pass on and make disciples of all people. Invite them into this. There's three reasons. Three things that happen in baptism. Three things that Jesus is declaring in this statement. First of all, he's talking about a transfer of ownership. Transfer of ownership, okay? So the original language that Matthew is using, uh, the, the, the phrasing he's using to talk about this being baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that in the name of business, it, the, the phraseology w- was, was typically used uh, for a legal transaction. Most notably when, when land was passing from one owner to the other. So, so quite literally, this land that, that belongs to me is transferred to this guy because he bought it, and now it's no longer in my name, it's in his name. Why? Because he paid a price. What Jesus is saying is that that's exactly what baptism does. That's what you're participating in. You're participating in a transfer of ownership. Your your ownership is being transferred quite literally from death to life. Why? Because a price was paid. Paul says it this way in in, in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. With Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. By the grace and mercy of Jesus, your ownership has shifted from death into life. You you no longer belong to death. You don't even belong to yourself. You belong to God because he paid a price for you, a heavy price, a price that he was very willing to pay, but a a price he very intentionally paid to claim your Ownership. Second thing that happens when we are baptized is an immersion into transformation. Okay, so again, the literal language that, that, that Matthew is using here, it, it describes a, a baptism in the form of immersion. That, that literally means to be dunked under water, as, as you often see uh, us practice here. So to be moved under the water is obviously to symbolize Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again in glory to claim his seat on his throne for all of eternity. When we practice baptism, we are symbolizing that, that, that same motion. We, we are dead in our sins. We rise to new life. Like that, That's the symbolism, but it's bigger than symbolism. What Jesus is saying here is that an actual immersion takes place when, when we practice baptism. We are being immersed into the Trinitarian relationship. The relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is as confusing as it often is to us. The one thing we can be absolutely certain of is inside that relationship is where transformation happens. It is within that relationship that power is released. It was from that relationship that creation happened. It's from that relationship that life change has consistently happened throughout Scripture. It's from that relationship that we are made new. It's exactly what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians 5.17 when he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has been baptized in the name of Jesus, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Not only is your ownership shifted from death to life, from the enemy to the father, but your identity has shifted. You are not what you were. You've been made new. You are a new 
creation with a new purpose, with a new future and a hope because of your immersion in the Trinitarian relationship. And then finally, third thing, third thing that happens when we are baptized is is a propulsion into a life of obedience. You, You are propelled into knowing, understanding, following all the commandments that Jesus gave to us. Now, it's hugely important that we understand something here, that by the way that Jesus has, has offered this, by the way that Jesus has presented this, he's making it very, very clear that one happens before the other. You cannot be propelled into obedience until you've experienced tangible faith. It is not until your ownership has shifted and your identity has shifted that the second one is made possible. What Jesus is, is quite literally presenting here is a doorway. You want to move into my kingdom? You want to represent my kingdom? You want to bring about my kingdom? Only one way to do that, you got to move through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I'm the doorway. Baptism, that baptism's how you step through it. Baptism's how you step into this life of obedience. I've always wondered, just, just practically speaking, I mean, you think about it, like, well, we've already talked about, like, baptism's kind of weird. Like, why do we do this? We get dunked underwater, we come up, like, everything's supposed to be different. Why did Jesus choose that as, as a doorway? Like, why was that the thing? And, and, and I don't know. I, I'm excited to ask God one day, like, God, explain to me, like, like why, exactly why you chose this. But, but you know a pretty good answer I've come up with? Because it's really easy. It's really easy. I mean, and Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And, and, and he says, you want, you want to step into me? You want to step into faith with me? Just get wet. I took on a grave. I, I went into a tomb. I rose from the dead. All you got to do is go into water. And come back up and let's start moving. Let's start walking. Baptism shifts our ownership. Baptism transforms our identity. Baptism propels us into a life of obedience. This this is why we do it. This this is why baptism happens. This is why God invites us into it. This is why Jesus encouraged us to do it. This is is why I did it. This is why those of you in this room who have done it, that's why you did it. This This is why. And so the most obvious question to now ask is where are you? Where are you in, in terms of, of baptism, in, in terms of the invitation to, to have your ownership shifted, to, to have your identity transformed and be propelled into a life of obedience? And Jesus, where, where are you? For some of you, like where you are has a very, very easy next step. For example, if you've never experienced baptism, if, if you've never trusted Jesus in baptism, if you've been listening and, you, and you've been curious and you've got questions and you've thought, you know what, I want to follow Jesus. I, I, I want to you know, step forward in obedience. I want to be a part of this kingdom. Well, the next step is really, really simple. Do it. If you've not been baptized and you, you've heard this truth, and you've heard who Jesus is and you've heard what Jesus has done and, and you've heard what Jesus desires for you, then then. What's stopping you? Water's available. We can make it happen. If you're gathered with us in person right now, as soon as, as, soon as this service is over, just walk forward. Tell the first person you run into that, that, that you know, either volunteers here or works here or you think might be doing one of those things. Hey, I want to get baptized today. We'll make it happen. Maybe you came with somebody right now. Turn to them. If they're a trusted friend, family member, journey partner, turn to them and say, hey, today, I want to do it today. I want to get baptized today. If you're joining us online, put it in the chat right now. I want to do it. We'll make it happen. It's huge. It's life-changing. It changes everything. So let's do it. Now, for some of you, the, the next step is a little more complicated. Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I've, I've participated in a form of baptism. Maybe you're, you're in a situation where you're thinking back, and, and like many people in our region, you come from a faith tradition where, where you were sprinkled as a child, but you never participated in, in baptism by immersion. You were sprinkled, or, or you were dedicated, or, or whatever the case may be, and, and you're wondering, do I need to do something else? Do, do I need to take another step? Maybe you're, you're sitting there and you think, well, I was baptized by immersion. That was a long time ago, and, and life looked different then, and, and life since then wouldn't necessarily be marked by obedience. 
Maybe for whatever reason you're, you're sitting here today and, and you're, you're second-guessing whatever form of baptism you, you participated in. You're wondering if it, if it was adequate, if it was effective. Something else needs to be done. And hear me, hear, hear me on this. I, I don't want to generalize things. I would love for there to be one sentence I can, I can speak to absolutely every one of you who's in that boat that, that clears everything up, but, but it's not that simple. It's complicated. And so it, it requires a complicated answer. It, it ultimately requires a conversation. So my encouragement to you would, would be have one. It can start with, with, with asking yourself a few questions. That, that can help you establish at least where you're at. And, and the questions I would ask is, is this. Has this happened? Has ownership been transferred in your life? Do, do you belong wholeheartedly to God or, or do you belong to something else? Has transformation happened? I mean, do you feel like, like you're a new creation? Like, like if you moved from what you were into to what God desires you to be? Have you been propelled into a life of obedience? On a daily basis, do you feel like you're getting closer to Jesus? Do you feel like you look more like Jesus every single day? If the answer to any of those is no, or if the answer to any of those is even I don't know, talk to somebody. Talk to one of us. Talk talk to a trusted friend. Talk to a trusted journey partner. Talk to somebody. Let's pray through it. God tells us anytime you lack wisdom, just come to me. I'll make the path straight. So let's take him at his word and let, let's come to him. But b- b- bottom line, for every single one of us, no matter, no matter where you are, is we've got to understand this, this one pivotal truth about the gospel. This is true today. This was true last week. This, this will continue to be true throughout this series. So the, the gospel doesn't just include movement. The, the gospel is defined by movement. The gospel requires movement. No matter where you are, God wants to move you forward. Because God has a desire for you. God has a plan for you. God has a future and a hope for you. And you, you can't find that. You can't experience that by being stationary. So, so wherever you are, in this conversation or any other, wherever you are, the, the goal today, the charge today is move. Move towards Jesus. And, and for some of you, that, that's stepping into the waters of baptism. For some of you, that, that's making a decided movement today to go and make disciples, to have conversations, to invest in relationships so you can lead them to the truth, so you can lead people into baptism, into a life of obedience. Jesus is calling us to move. He's given us the authority to do so. And he's promised to walk with us every step of the way. And so may we not waste a single second. May we go. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for for the hope of Jesus. Father God, we thank you so much for, for the truth of the gospel. We were dead. A price was paid. And we can now be alive. And so, Lord, I pray that that movement takes place in every single heart in this room, Lord, that that we would each and every one of us, no, no matter where we are, we would move deeper into the ownership of God over our lives. Lord, we we would move deeper into transformation that only you can bring. We would move deeper into the obedience that Jesus has called us to the journey that he has set us on, promising to walk with us step for step. May we trust him and may we move with him. And then, Lord, may our lives become a reflection of that. May our lives tell the story of hope and redemption to people who have not heard it. And as we are going, may we make disciples boldly and intentionally. May we invest these truths, may we invest this hope into the lives of people who desperately need it. Lord, I pray very, very boldly, very, very intentionally that this isn't just one of the things we do, that this would become our all-consuming focus, 
This is the reason for our existence. We, we do a lot of other things in life. We have jobs, we have families, we have obligations, but this is our mission. To make much of you. To carry your name well. And to share hope with everyone. So Father God, charge us, empower us, send us. And as we are going, may we rely wholeheartedly power of Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen.